Uh, so I got a very good question from one of the uh, class students uh, about the previous exercise and about uh, interpreting the results of that exercise uh, and specifically with respect to likelihood values returned by the models. In that exercise, uh, you were using several different HMM models, hidden Markov models, to, uh, to try to figure out, amongst other things, what their implications would be for the true underlying state of that system at any one time. You may recall that with hidden Markov models, we're typically dealing with a, a, a system that is posited to be in one of a set of a couple of states. Maybe it's two states, maybe it's five states, maybe it's 10 possible states, but there's some unobserved state and there's some output contingent on that state. And we're trying to infer at any one time what state it's in. And in that exercise, you went through and you tried that with a couple of different models. And then you tried to find the best model for explaining the data. Best in the sense that it, it had the highest likelihood of observing the data. We have the different possible models that would characterize the evolution of some underlying system and, and say how it relates to to the data that's observed, how, how each state would give rise to data. And some of those models are more competitive. Some of them are more plausible. Some of them are more consistent with the data. For some, the data would be a bizarre fluke, just a, a strange happenstance of the most extreme sort. Whereas for others, the data is entirely plausible. And we use the likelihood to kind of distinguish these, to try to identify the best model where best was taken in terms of being the one that would most make, make the observed data most likely to have occurred. And uh, in so doing, for each such model, we examined the likelihood that it would explain the data, that that, da excuse me, that that data would be observed given that model. So that that particular data would be produced given that model. We, we assess that for different models. At a technical level, we were looking at the negative log likelihood, but the basic gist of it is we, we want to see which of these models made it most likely we'd see data like that. And the idea was, you know, that the one that would make that data most expected at some level, most plausible, most likely, that would, that would most likely give rise to that data. Um, that was the model that had the greatest base plausibility. It could have been produced by weird fluke of a model that was, that, you know, a different model, but, um, that strains credulity after a certain number of data points. It's vanishingly unlikely after a modest number of data points that we do observe this data. So that was, that was what we were doing there. But the student asked a very perceptive question, which I really liked a lot. Um, he asked, um, he said, look, so for each of these models, we were assessing its likelihood of observing that data. And there were some of those models that had a higher likelihood. And, and, and we futzed around and we located some that had a higher likelihood of observing the data. And then actually in that exercise, you ran an optimization algorithm that automatically zeroed in on one that was most likely to observe that data and reported the parameters for it as part of the exercise. But what the student observed is that even with the most likely model, the chance of observing that data is 
extraordinarily small. I mean, it's like 10 to the minus 240 or something. It's, it, it, it would seem that even with the, the best model, you know, it, it might be a poor model. It's, it's making it so unlikely we'd observe that data. Um, to what degree are we just, you know, rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic and, and, and you know, futzing around to find the best model out of a set of lousy models? That was a very good question. But uh, it's good because it, it points to advance and understanding. Um, actually, it's not the case that those are bad models. It's not the case just because the likelihood is very, very small that it's a bad model. Not at all. Not at all. Um, it's routine that the likelihood of observing some sequence by itself is, is extremely small, even though the model is very, very good. And, I want to explain this, um, and uh, for that purpose, I have a, I have a coin here. Um, so, this is a, a loony, and uh, we have um, the head of Queen Elizabeth on one side, and we have the uh, uh, the tail of a uh, loon on the other side. Um, and I'll I'll flip this coin. Um, and uh, here I am flipping it a bunch of a bunch of times, and each time I get either a head or a tail, um, a, a human head or a loon's tail, no less. Um, I could flip it five times, ten times, a hundred times, a thousand times, um, and each time I'll get a sequence of heads and tails. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm flipping this coin, and each time I'm getting out a, a sequence of heads and tails. Now, there are two models that we might, might examine. Two obvious models to examine for that are one might be the coin is fair. It has an equal probability of coming up heads or tails. That would be one model that we have for, for what's going on for that stochastic process that gives rise to the data of a thousand coin flips. So we have a sequence of a thousand coin flips, tail, head, 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 tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, blah, 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 a thousand times. And one model to, that would explain that, that would, that, that would posit a certain data generating process it, is um, a model of a fair coin. There might be another model that says we're dealing with a coin that's loaded, a loaded coin, and where the loon comes up 99% of the time and Queen Elizabeth, poor Queen Elizabeth only comes up 1% of the time. Uh, that, that's another model that competes with our fair coin model to explain the data. Now, each of those models, here's, here's the key point. Each of those models has a certain likelihood of observing a given sequence of data. So if I, if I have a sequence that says head, 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 tail, head, tail, you know, a hundred long or a thousand long, say a thousand long, that sequence is very particular, right? And it's head in the first position, tail in the second, head in the third or whatever. Um, and, the pro and the likelihood of observing that particular sequence for either of the models is very small. Um, why? Well, even the head, the, the fair coin model, and I think this carrot coin is pretty close to fair. Um, even that, I mean, the chance that I get that particular sequence compared to any other sequence when I flip this coin a thousand times is very, very small. I mean, there's, uh, uh, there's some 
very small chance I get that particular sequence. There's another small chance that I get any other sequence there. Um, and, and so it has, a, it has a low likelihood, even if the fair coin model, which is a much better characterization of what's going on than the loaded, the loony model that has 99% chance of getting a loony, uh, a, a, sorry, a loon and 1% and chance of getting Queen Elizabeth. Uh, that one also makes it implausible that I'll get the sequence, but it's even more implausible that I'll, I'll get the sequence. But even the, the fair coin one has a very low chance of getting that particular sequence because there's a huge variety of other sequences of length thousand. So it's not a it's not a shortcoming of that model per se. Um, it's not a it doesn't indicate some deep problem, some deep um, you know inability of the model to explain the data. That its likelihood of observing that sequence is very small for the fair coin. No, that may be the best model to explain this sequence of a thousand long. It's just the probability of getting that specific sequence is very small. Um, and what we're looking for is the model that has the highest likelihood of observing that sequence. Um, but the actual likelihood is still going to be very small. Now, the, the loony model, where it's 99% likely to, to observe the loon and 1% likely to observe Queen Elizabeth on a given flip, um, you know, that might be vastly less likely to observe the data. But even the, the fair coin model has a, a low likelihood of observing that particular sequence. And it doesn't mean it's a bad model. It's by far the best model, perhaps, but it's still a low, low likelihood. So just because you see a low likelihood, a small likelihood, it's not an indication that you're dealing with a bad model. Um, not, not at all. And in fact, the longer the sequence is, if this were a sequence of length, you know, 10, the probability of observing that particular sequence of length 10 um, is not huge, but it's, it's, it's not small. If it's a fair coin, it would be like one over two to the 10th or one over 1,024, about 0 0.001. Um, if it's a, length, a sequence of length 100, it's like one over two to the 100th probability of observing that particular sequence with a fair coin. If it's length 1,000, it's like one over two to the 1,000th. Um, and the longer the sequence is, the more and more unlikely it is we'll observe that particular sequence. But that's not the fault of the model, per se. We're looking for the the model that's the highest likelihood, but the actual likelihood may be very small and typically is very small. And the longer the sequences are, the smaller and smaller that likelihood is. Um, uh, so, so just because you're dealing with a small likelihood is not an indication that you're dealing with a broken model, a model that's deeply inadequate or something like that, far from it. Um, it may be that you're, I mean, typically it's a reflection of the fact you're dealing with a bunch of data and any model um, could produce a bunch of different data. And this is just one of a lot of them. And so the likelihood of observing this particular long sequence of data is very small, very small. Um, anyway, that was a, a comment on this issue of likelihoods. It actually uh, is an important point to understand and practice. And it has a important practical implication that the student was also asking about. And, and again, it reflects uh, uh, a good, uh, a good you know, inquiring mind wondering about, about uh, you know, how to interpret these things. When we have a sequence that's long, the likelihood of observing it compared to any other sequence is small. We could get any other sequence. So it's almost by definition, very small. That we'll observe that particular sequence. Um, because it's small, 
representing the actual likelihood, the, the honest to goodness likelihood, is, is actually very hard for a computer. Um, it, it, it's so close to zero that if we represent it naively, try to write it out 0 0.0000000, and you don't want to hear a whole lecture of zeros. If we do that, um, if we write it out that way, um, we're bound as the size of the sequence goes up to quickly get to a point where the computer says, ah, it's basically zero, we round it off to zero. And computer, computers have this representation of arithmetic um, involving real numbers. Yes, rational numbers, uh, but, but involving these, these decimal quantities, um, which is all standardized, but it has a limited precision. It can only have so many digits after the decimal point before it goes belly up and said basically it's zero. Um, there's a whole IEEE standard um, associated with it, and, and it, it only can only get so small. So um, what to do? Well, uh, within the context of, of uh, machine learning, uh, it's very common that we represent the log of the likelihood. or in some cases, the negative of the log of the likelihood. So instead of representing you know, 0 0.001, we'd represent, if we did it log 10, if it were log 10, it would be minus three. Um, and instead of representing 0 0.001, we'd represent minus four, meaning if the log of it is, it, it, is, the log base 10 is, is minus four. Um, so it's very typical we represent the log of the likelihood rather than the likelihood itself because the likelihood gets so small as the sequence grows larger and larger and larger um, that if we try to keep track of the likelihood, we'll bound to get round off error. And even if it doesn't round it to zero, its ability to keep track of the differences between small numbers is, is very limited. So we instead represent the log of it. And, and there's a very common trick. Um, it's typically quite easy to do in general. Uh, you're carrying around these logs of these things, often the natural log rather than the, the actual number. But when we do that, sometimes it comes into our, um, at a practical level, we have to do a little bit more work. Um, for example, uh, if we multiply numbers, we add their logs, right? Add their logarithms of the numbers. Uh, the log of A times B is the log of A plus the log of B. Mm. Um, so that, that's good. But there are times where we want to do something else. Like we want to add two numbers. And gosh, if we just have two numbers themselves, we'll just add them together, one and done. Um, but if we, if we have the log of A and the log of B and we want to add A and B, well, okay, we got to do a bit more work. Um, and it turns out that when you actually implement machine learning algorithms and you're using these log logs of values, um, you've got to do some extra work. Um, and uh, and there, there are times that that crops up. And there are these kind of clever algorithms people have created, which, which use logs to, to perform calculations in some non-obvious ways. Um, for example, if you, have a, if you have a bunch of particles, and each of them is associated with a weight. And maybe we represent the weight with a log of the weight instead of the weight. So we can tolerate really low weights. Um, if we do that, uh, 
and then we need to normalize the weights. Well, gosh, to normalize, you have to add up the weights and the weights are all logs. So how do you add them up? And it, it turns out people have come up with um, kind of clever ways to, to do it in terms of computing with the logarithms. And there's a, the whole art to that. So you need, you want to speak with someone who, who knows the way around that stuff and um, can point you to appropriate algorithms that, that operate on those logarithmic values. Generally, it's not a problem, but occasionally when you come to implementing these machine learning algorithms, it's a little bit of a pain and, and you just got to got to build on the shoulders of giants, stand on the shoulders of giants. And, and, uh, uh, and, and you know, use, uh, the, use these kind of clever tricks that people have come up with to, to help you out at certain places in implementing these algorithms. Anyway, those are some comments. These were perceptive things, um, perceptive questions, but the long and short of it is, when we're operating with machine learning algorithms, it's no, it's not an indication of some grave shortcoming with a, a model that it's likely it is very, very, very small. Um, in fact, we expect as we get more and more data, more and more observations, the likelihood of observing that will get smaller and smaller um, just because there's more possibilities what we could have observed. And what we're looking for instead is not to judge a model by how small it's likely it is per se, but how small it is relative to any other model. Um, hope those comments are, are helpful in interpreting you know, likelihoods. Um, as it turns out, some of them are, are, rel are, are actually a bunch of, several of those comments are quite relevant in dealing with particle filter again, particle MCMC. So that was just a preface um, involving interpretation of likelihoods. So I'm gonna stop that recording.